Thanks for watching the second edition of Henry AI Labs AI Research Weekly Update. This is a video series that covers uh, blog posts and research updates in deep learning and artificial intelligence. Following this introduction video is going to be a list of the blogs and newsletters sourced for the aggregating of the content in this video. This video is going to cover exciting things like the efficient transformer networks from Facebook, achieving uh, test accuracy on CIFAR 10 of 94% in just 26 seconds of training time, Waymo's open source data set, uh, OpenAI's new metric for diverse adversarial robustness, amongst many other things. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and artificial intelligence videos. The following is the list of blog posts covered to make the second episode of Henry AI Labs AI Research Weekly Update, August 25th, 2019. These blogs aren't listed in any rank order, and the links to each of the blogs will be provided in the description below. Please provide any suggestions in the comments to blogs and AI labs and or newsletters that you think should be covered to source this video. A really interesting blog post from Facebook AI looks at making transformed networks simpler and more efficient through two key modifications. So this is a really interesting blog post contrasting to many other posts that look at making transformer networks sort of like as complex as possible by scaling them up to have billions of parameters like NVIDIA's project Megatron and then discussing the implication of highly parametric which uh, things like OpenAI's discussion on GP2.2 where they're sort of just saying uh, scale up the parameters and you get a better language model. But Facebook AI's post uh, and research is looking at making them more efficient for the parameters that they do have. So this is done through the adapt adaptive attention span and the all attention layer. So they first uh, provide this uh, explanation of how discovering long-term relations in data requires a longer attention span. However, if you just increase the attention span of each of the transformer heads, the computation time and memory footprint of the transformer will explode. So what they look at, well first they notice that the attention spans in the different heads of the transformer aren't all used efficiently. So what they do is they deploy this differentiable scheme with a soft masking function to learn the attention span in each attention head. So this results in a much more efficient model and the distribution of attention across the layers is shown in this plot. And it's really interesting that only five out of the 96 heads have an attention span of over a thousand steps going as high as 8,000 steps, whereas the average attention span is only 200 steps. So the other modification they propose is the all attention layer. And this is a modification where they discuss how the relationship between the self-attention layer and the feed-forward layer can really be merged into making this one all-attention layer. So I think it helps to understand this to visualize their animation a few times. Is OpenAI's post GPT-2 six-month follow-up. OpenAI, the way that they released GPT-2, received a lot of uh, you know, a lot of interest in the community, a lot of people saying that, oh, they haven't really proved that their language model really is state of the art. But in general, they did, uh, they presented a new way to release a generative uh, language model, and they discussed the different implications of doing it this way, how they got other uh, institutions like Hugging Face and the Allen Institute of Artificial Intelligence to also uh, adopt a similar stage release of their new language models. And now they're discussing how they're going to release the next level, their 774 million parameter GPT-2 model. And they discuss what they've learned in the publishing of the smaller models. So something interesting, they discussed the coordination with Hugging Face and the Allen Institute for a similar stage release approach. And then this is a really interesting study they find where they use the GPT-2 to generate text samples and 72% of the cohort judge the articles to be credible from the New York Times, whereas they only judge the actual articles to 83%. So the gap is 72% to 83% with the GPT-2 samples. And they also discussed how detecting the synthetic, the generated text is really difficult. And, you know, generally they discuss the different uh, institutions that are looking into different specific problems with these language models and the societal implications of releasing AI language models that can generate text that is convincing as if it was written by a human. So generally they present this uh, timeline of the GPT-2 model and sort of, uh, you know, large transformer models in general. Things like the TalkToTransformer.com website, which is where you can uh, seed the transformer with some kind of initial sentence like, I love AI because, and then you can see how the GPT-2 will complete your article for you. So overall, it's a really interesting history of the GPT-2 model. 
talk about the most recent uh, advances. They've released their 774 million parameter GPT-2. And then talk about how NVIDIA's Project Megatron has just trained a 8.3 billion parameter GPT-2 model using that model parallelism technique discussed in last week's episode. OpenAI published Testing Robustness Against Unforeseen Adversaries. In this article, they present a new metric, UAR, Unforeseen Attack Robustness, which evaluates uh, classification models and their robustness to different adversarial attacks. So first, they uh, begin the article by presenting different kinds of adversarial attacks, the L infinity, where each pixel value can be changed by at most 32, and then L1, where there's a vector norm, and all these different kinds of distortions to images that adversarial attacks can use to cause misclassifications. Probably most, uh, you know, most alarming is this fog distortion and the snow distortion, which if you imagine things like self-driving cars could be a huge problem. So in this article, they discuss how defending against one distortion might not transfer to defenses against all adversarial attacks. So when they, uh, at first, when they are defending against this attack A, they do see an increase in defense to B, but then eventually as the distortion improves in A, it uh, begins to fall dramatically in B. So this new uh, metric is used to evaluate adversarial robustness across many different attacks. And they, in their article, uh, provide some source code for computing the UAR for your classification model. And they uh, present these different like elastic, fog, gabber, and snow uh, adversarial attack methods to, uh, you know, have a diverse set of different adversarial attacks to evaluate classification models on. Google published a machine learning pipeline for on-device real-time hand tracking with the, implemented with the MediaPipe open source cross-platform framework. So the way the hand tracking does works is um, you want to follow this hand and then classify the, dis the different gestures. So for example, open hand, fist, horns, uh, different numbers like one, two, three, four, five, and uh, you know, these kinds of things. So overall, this is really useful for building user interfaces and for interpreting things like sign language. So the way that their pipeline works is first they pass the images into a palm detector model called Blaze Palm that returns the oriented hand bounding box. So this is implemented with a single shot detector uh, bounding box algorithm optimized for use on mobile phones. So once they have the uh, palm detection bounding box, they input this to a hand landmark model that is going to predict the 3D key points. So this means uh, predicting the different joint locations on the hand. If, if you can kind of see how I'm trying to uh, highlight the different uh, key points with my cursor on this uh, GIF image. So once they have the key points, they then pass it to a gesture recognizer, which is a set of uh, if-else uh, rules that are hard-coded into the pipeline to detect the different gestures. So in the article, they present the high-level idea of their pipeline and then they discuss uh, miscellaneous things they do to improve it from a baseline of 86.2% up to 95.7% average precision in the palm detection. Then they discuss their hand landmark model and they discuss how they used uh, synthetic data. See, if you look in this picture, uh, these top row are real images of hands and then these are uh, synthetic images uh, generated by a high quality graphics engine. So they discuss uh, the trick that they use with the hand presence and the uh, sharing of these features to improve the model's uh, use of the synthetic data with relation to the real data. So overall, you can see how their uh, model performs with the pipeline and how well it uh, seems to recognize all these gestures like Rock, Spider-Man. And uh, you get a high level overview of how it's implemented in the uh, media pipe uh, framework. Really interesting progress on the Stanford Dawn Bench competition, which is a competition to see how fast you can train a network to have 94% test accuracy on the CIFAR 10 dataset, has resulted in doing this in 34 seconds without test time augmentation and 26 seconds with it. So the way that they do this is by utilizing statistical significance to test a series of small modifications and determine if the accumulation of them will result in faster training. So some of the modifications that they derive are preprocessing on the GPU, moving max pool layers, uh, label smoothing, CLU activations, ghost batch norm, frozen batch norm scales, input patch whitening, and then exponential moving averages and test time augmentation. This is a really interesting blog post if you're interested in how you can train your ResNets and miscellaneous uh, neural networks faster. And overall, another really interesting thing is that they're able to do this on a single GPU. Definitely a really interesting blog post to check out and learn more if you're interested in the Dawn Bench competition and the efficient and fast training of neural networks. Additionally, they also show how the uh, training at faster to higher accuracy can result in better accuracy long term.
The Stanford AI Lab blog posted a really interesting discussion on what makes a good conversation by Abigail C. So the blog post begins by discussing how uh, different natural language generation tasks can vary so much in how you evaluate them. So for example, machine translation is less open-ended and can be easily evaluated with things like the blue score, whereas things like story generation and chit-chat dialogue are more difficult to evaluate. So in this article, they present the research questions on how can we control the attributes of a conversation, with these attributes being defined as things like uh, specificity, when you're a a like answering a question, how specific do you answer that question, do you repeat yourself, how often do you ask questions. So they uh, present this task, the persona chat task, which is where the persona has these attributes about them, and they sort of integrate these attributes into their conversation with the uh, other persona. So they discuss their model that they use to test the ways that they can control attributes of the text in the chat bot system. So these attributes in include reducing the repetition, reducing the genericness of responses, responding on topic, not ignoring the user, and then the optimal rate of question asking. So they present, uh, and then they also show these different ways that they can judge conversational aspects to try to compare apples to apples and see how well they can control these different attributes of conversations like repetitiveness, specificity, and response relatedness. So overall, they present the conditional training method of control, which is basically you have P of Y, which Y would be the word you output given the X and the Z, where the X, where the, I mean, the Z is the control variable. So Z would be sent to high or low to get a specific or a generic response to certain questions. And they learned the Z through an, a learn embedding and then weighted decoding another technique for controlling these attributes. So they discuss how well they can control the attributes in the conversations and overall they conclude that they can control them pretty well. And overall it's just a really good, a really well written paper and a blog post on overall aspects of chatbots if you're interested in this area of research. Facebook presented an article about how Oculus is powered by AI to do miscellaneous things. So this article covers things like how they uh, use their computer vision models to predict the path of your of your gestures to uh, render it in the AR VR simulation. So you see here, uh, as you reach and grab the ball, they want to reduce the latency by predicting the movement you're about to make with your hand using AI and deep learning. And another thing they talk about is the use of SLAM, simultaneous location and mapping, which is where you're trying to uh, infer the position of an agent and map out the environment at the same time. And they overall just describe how they use, uh, well not in complete detail in the blog post, but they basically give you an overview of how they use machine learning models to uh, do predictive analytics and facilitate these kinds of uh, renderings. Uber published a conversation with Jeff Kloon, a senior research manager at Uber. Jeff Kloon is one of the top leading uh, researchers in AI, and it was really interesting to hear things about his story of how he came into the game, sort of, and how he was inspired by a uh, professor at Cornell University's research on using evolutionary algorithms to create uh, robots that when they were 3D printed, they could walk on their own in the real world. So in this interview, it, uh, the biggest takeaways for me, it was really interesting to hear about how Jeff uh, completed his PhD in the pursuit of joining this lab. And I also thought it was interesting to hear about how Uber AI Labs came to be by acquiring this company called Geometric Intelligence. And amongst other things, uh, you can hear his thoughts on recent work like open-ended algorithms like the POET algorithm and generally neuroevolution, which he is an expert in, and how, uh, how he sees evolutionary algorithms advancing the state of AI. Uber also posted, Science at Uber making a real-world impact with data science. This blog post links to four short YouTube videos, each about 2 minutes and 30 seconds, that uh, discuss different ways that machine learning is used at Uber. The first video generally talks about uh, using machine learning to forecast traffic, pa traffic patterns, how to better predict travel time estimates, and generate improved routes for driver partners on the Uber platform. One interesting thing is about uh, spatial and temporal correlations about how traffic in one part of the city might impact traffic in another part. The second video discusses improving GPS in urban centers, the phenomenon of how buildings create an urban canyon that obscure satellites and how they can use the occlusion of the satellites as a signal to improve location. The third video discusses predictions of demand and predictions of time travel between point A and B, and how they can uh, predict the travel time along each road segment and even transfer from certain road segments that have a lot of historical data to other road segments that might share similar uh, meta characteristics but don't have as much travel time historical information on you know, maybe days of the week, uh, different times throughout the day. The fourth video uh, generally discusses the different branches of AI at like 
deep learning, reinforcement learning, probabilistic learning. And it has this interesting, uh, he presents this interesting concept. He says, trees don't have brains. And why is this? That the purpose of brains is movement and that, a and that AI and Uber, they're focused on movement. And it's an interesting thing to think about. Another really interesting piece of news in deep learning and computer vision is that Waymo has decided to open source their self-driving car data set. So this is a great chance for computer vision researchers and people to get involved in self-driving cars and get their feet wet with the different kinds of algorithms that are used to power this technology. So this data set contains things like 2D bounding boxes around, around uh, cars and people, amongst other things. And then it has uh, more complicated LiDAR data. And you can learn more about the Waymo open data set by going to waymo.com open. From Google AI, they've posted Turbo, an improved rainbow color map for visualization. So with things like uh, depth estimation and depth images, you have these kinds of color maps that sort of provide a visualization of the depth of different objects. And so as opposed to black and gray, there's also a lot of interest in using these uh, color scales to visualize this. But things like the jet rainbow map shown here has these sharp transitions that aren't really uh, like perceptually consistent from dark red to dark blue in this transition. So in this article, they compare some other color schemes like uh, Virtus and Inferno, which are both available in Matplotlib, and you can see how they uh, handle the transition from light to dark colors to visualize depth in images. So overall, they are, want to push this rainbow color map to be more smooth. You see right here how this is way more smooth than this is, and in this case as well, it's really visually obvious. So they overall, they present this uh, turbo map, which is you know, much more visually smooth in contrast with this jet. And then in contrast to Veritas and Inferno, Turbo allows you to, you know, use these colors that are so categorical, like you can say, oh, the red section or the green section or the blue section, which is maybe more useful than saying uh, dark green, light green. You know, it has a more uh, appealing idea of using the rainbow color map. But the challenge in this is creating a smooth rainbow color map in the... Uh, darkness of colors and the uh, linearity of how it transitions. DeepMind recently released a podcast, uh, four episodes of their podcast, where they discuss different areas of AI research at DeepMind and sort of explain what they're doing. Like the first episode will cover things like uh, unbounded AI systems and these funny things like that popular example of the reinforcement learning boat that is supposed to be going around the track but instead just loops around collecting the coins. They talk about things like human in the loop learning and you generally, it's really well produced and I really recommend watching it. The second episode is a great uh, accounting of AlphaGo Zero and AlphaGo and sort of the story of how this came to be. I really recommend checking out this podcast. Also in this week is the Natural Language Processing News monthly newsletter curated by Sebastian Ruder, who's one of the top uh, research scientists in natural language processing. This newsletter has uh, tons of resources to stay up to date with natural language processing with things like blog posts, papers, slides from talks, and videos and miscellaneous things. So the theme of the newsletter are juxtapositions with things like training really big models like NVIDIA's Project Megatron that trains the GPT-2 model to 8 billion parameters, and things like OpenAI's uh, like release where they discuss the releasing of even bigger models like from their 135 million parameter model up to the most recent release of 774 million parameters. And then contrastingly is a discussion of making these transformer models smaller via things like knowledge distillation or uh, model compression, and also things like Facebook's adaptive attention span and the all attention layer. So also uh, the theme is powerful models versus dumb models. And then overall the newsletter just presents uh, many great resources for learning more about natural language processing and also some great open source tools you can use like Gluon NLP to get into uh, natural language processing. Also things like faster word tokenization with the byte pair encoding and overall, it's just a great list of resources if you're interested in natural language processing. This week's edition of The Batch from DeepLearning.ai begins by presenting the opening of their offices in Medellin, Colombia. They discuss how they think that Colombia is on a trajectory to become a hub of AI in Latin America. Their news begins by showing a, a t-shirt design to combat surveillance in parking systems. This is a really interesting idea, uh, sort of sparking conversation about surveillance technology and people's opposition to it. They, uh, in the article, in the analysis from the batch, they discuss how this uh, OCR, uh, optical character recognition system works and how it isn't uh, designed to have much of a sense of the context around the letters it detects. And therefore, this t-shirt is able to uh, produce noisy data into their database and you know, render their system ineffective. 
although they do say that even if this became a widespread phenomenon, they could probably have an adversarial clothing detector that would make this useless. So the next thing they present is this article from Gary Marcus about DeepMind losing $572 million and him sort of pronouncing that reinforcement learning is robbing the AI research from other approaches, especially those based on cognitive sciences. So the batch, they argue against it, they see many applications of deep reinforcement learning and uh, DeepMind's investments, such as uh, optimizing Google's data centers for uh, resource utilization and efficiency. Yeah, and overall, this was a pretty interesting uh, post from Gary Marcus that, uh, that uh, invoked a lot of response in the AI community. The addition of the batch concludes with the discussion of the Roberta model from Facebook, which is the next language model in the sequence of BERT to XLNet to Roberta. They discuss how this technique makes use of uh, more aggressive training data sizes, uh, batch sizes in the sequence length, and the number of pre-training steps. Additionally, they uh, discuss the implications of how the fine-tuning used in Roberta makes it so maybe if you don't have uh, the proper resources, you won't be able to compete on the natural language uh, processing benchmarks like squad question answering and uh, miscellaneous other things. The episode of The Batch concludes with a discussion of how they're trying to standardize and regularize uh, AI development and a new technique uh, using a GAN architecture to synthesize style and texture in image-to-image -image translation tasks. Thanks for watching this week of AI Research Weekly Update from Henry AI Labs. Please subscribe for more artificial intelligence and deep learning videos. Additionally, please leave any suggestions and comments for how you think that this weekly update series can be improved. Thanks for watching.